Okay, I'm actually genuinely excited about this video because I'm going to be sharing a preview of new version of local GPT that I have been working on for the last few weeks. And if you're not familiar with local GPT, it's my own open source project that lets you chat with your documents completely privately in your own environment without the need of any external API keys. And it already has 20,000 stars on GitHub. And if you like this video, make sure you give it a star. What's new in this new local GPT? Well, it's written from the ground up without any frameworks. So we're not relying on LangGraph, LangChain, Llama Index, none of that. It's pure Python. But it has a ton of features that I think you probably haven't seen in any other RAG implementation, at least the open source ones. Let me first show you in action and then we're going to talk about the technical details. So let's say I select one of these indices that I have already created. This one contains invoices data and I think also the DeepSeq paper. I'm going to select this. We're going to start off with a query like this. What is the invoice amount that this company sent to Horizon Media? And where is solar wind energy located? Right now, we're working with unstructured data only. Everything is plain text from PDF files. Let's say we send this query in. Now, the first thing is local GPT analyzes this query and decides whether to use the RAG pipeline or its internal knowledge. And then if it finds that it needs to create multiple queries, it will do that. It does retrieval, re-ranking, context window expansion, and then it will start generating answers for those subqueries. Both the triage model and the subqueries are context aware. I'll explain that later in the video. Then it will do retrieval for each of the subqueries, do re-ranking. Then it has a context expansion step for each of the re-ranked chunks that it receives. Then at the moment, we're using a reasoning or thinking model to generate answers for each of the subqueries in parallel. So here's the answer for the uh, location, here's for the invoice amount. And all of this is fed into a model that is going to combine the user input plus the subqueries responses to generate the final response. And then there is a verified step which verifies and assigns it a score. Now, here is the architecture of the original local GPT. It's basically a naive or standard rack pipeline. Now, the new version of local GPT is a lot more complex. And in the rest of the video, I'm going to walk you through all of the different parts of local GPT. We're going to look at the code in a different video. But the goal is to give you a very good understanding of how to build a robust rack pipeline. Also, if you ask something like, who is the CEO of Tesla, it has no problem in just using its, its internal knowledge or to have the ability to use web search tools to look up that information. We can divide this implementation into three different parts. One is the front end. It's still work in progress. There are a few bugs here and there that I'm trying to fix. Then there is a back end, which has an agentic workflow, which decides when to use which step. I'm going to explain that in the video. And then there is a store components where we store the embedding vectors, keyword search index that it creates, also the chat history. Also, there's a caching component, right? And everything right now is driven by LMs that are hosted through Olama. But for a product, production system, I'd highly recommend to use something like VLLM. That integration is going to be also coming to local GPT. Now, all the techniques that I'm going to cover, which were used to build local GPT, are covered in my course, Rack Beyond Basics. So if you're interested, I'll highly recommend to check it out. But let me walk you through the different components of how this system is built. The first part is indexing or vector store creation. At the moment, it supports PDF files, but it's going to have support for all different types of unstructured data. I am also thinking of adding support for structured data, but that's going to come at a later point. Now, the first thing we do is when we upload PDF files, it's going to convert all of those into markdowns. And for that, at the moment, I'm using Docling. So essentially, using Docling, we are going to have support for Word files, HTML files, and everything that can contain unstructured data. Now, why markdowns? Well, markdowns actually preserve the structure of your documents. 
So let's say if you're working with academic papers like this, if you convert this PDF file to markdowns, you can easily keep track of what the title is, who are the authors, what are the sections, subsections. But if you use any of the other PDF loaders, they usually lose this structure of the data. And I'm a huge proponent of using the structure of your document when you are chunking, because that helps you preserve both the coherence and the consistency of your chunks. So that's why we use a structure aware chunker. It's a naive implementation at the moment, but it considers the structure that is present in the markdown file. At the moment, I think the chunk size is about 500 tokens with some overlap. Now, after that, we do two different things, which are very important. The first thing is that for every document, on the document level, I create overview or a document level summary. And we just use only the first five chunks. And the idea is we just want to know what is this document about? We don't want to look at all the details and summarize them, but in the first five chunks, it will give you enough information about the document. Let's say it's a legal document, whether it's an invoice, and this information is very critical when we're doing retrieval using a triage classifier or triage agent. So I'll explain that, but for each of the document that is coming in, we create this overview and we store this overview in a database. Next, we take each of the chunk and then I use contextual retrieval to create a summary of the surrounding chunks. So if you're not familiar with contextual retrieval, this is a technique from Anthropic. And the idea is that each chunk that you create, it lives in isolation because it doesn't really have any information about the rest of the document or the chunks around it. But if you use an LLM to say, contextualize this one chunk that I'm providing in the context of the whole document, you're going to add a couple of lines of summary that gives the model or the embedding model a context of the rest of the document associated with that chunk. In practice, if you want to use the whole document for a given chunk, it's going to be a very expensive process. So what local GPT does is that it looks at a sliding window around a chunk and you create that summary and append that summary with every chunk. Then we take that chunk along with this additional information. We create metadata directly, store that in a vector store. I'm using LanceDB for everything. It's a single file that you can move around, take it with you, put it somewhere, but you can potentially use something like PG vector as well. After this, we also extract keyword index for the same chunk. For creating this contextual summary, I'm using a relatively small 0.6 billion model. So it's less than 1 billion model. We want a very fast LLM to create these summaries. You don't want to use something like a 70 billion model or even a 7 billion model is probably an overkill. Same is the case for when we're creating these overview summaries for each chunk. At the end of this process, we are going to have multiple vector stores for multiple different representations. At the moment, I'm using the Quen3 embedding model to create the embeddings, but my plan is to have a more robust multi-vector representation. So you're going to see in the final version of local GPT, multiple different type of embeddings, late interaction, Colbert style embeddings, and also there are going to be some image embeddings as well. I have a local GPT vision, which does end to end vision based retrieval. So I'm planning on bringing some of the ideas from here to local GPT so that it's a truly multimodal retrieval system. This is just the indexing process. Now let's talk about what happens at retrieval. Once we finish the indexing and the user query comes in, the first thing it hits is this triage agent or what I'm calling a triage classifier. And the goal of this agent is to analyze the user query it has to make three different decisions. First, whether it want to use the whole rag pipeline or it can answer the user question based on the internal knowledge of the model or can it answer the question based on the chat history. Now, the way we do it is it's a small LLM, again, 0.6 billion model, and it has access to the overview summaries that we created in the first step. During, during indexing. Now, let's say if you have 
tens of thousands of documents. We just randomly sample some summaries from those. We don't want to overload the context window of this small model. But the idea would be that the model has enough information what type of documents information is present in your index. And based on that, when the user query comes in, it will decide whether I want to use the whole rack pipeline. We get the user query. Again, it uses a relatively small LLM to decide whether to decompose the query into subqueries or treat everything as a single query using the context that is provided through overviews present in the database. Then for each of the subquery, it will do this. So it is going to do retrieval on the dense embedding model and the BM25. And if we have any of the other representation, it's going to do parallel retrieval on all of them. It gets the top chunks, pass them through a cross encoder. So it, it does do de deduplication, then it passes through a cross encoder, which will re-rank the models. I am, I think, currently using a Colbert style re-ranker. There are a couple of options that I'm experimenting with. Colbert style re-ranker seems to be doing really well, but I want to make sure that we can do that at scale. But after that, we're going to get a number of different chunks with contextual information added to each of the chunks. But then we expand the window around these chunks again. The idea is to use something like parent child retrieval. Now, the idea over here is that when you retrieve a chunk, the surrounding chunks may actually contain relevant information, but because in the first step, they may not have been retrieved by the initial retrieval step. So we take one of the chunks and look at a sliding window. Right now, it's pretty conservative. So we only take the first two chunks around it. So instead of a single chunk that is re-ranked, we are going to expand it to two more chunks. And then we pass this to an agent or an LLM with a very detailed prompt and the LLM itself is a reasoning model. And the prompt actually tells it to analyze each chunk individually. So there is a secondary re-ranking step that is done by the LLM itself. Now, this way we're going to create or generate answers for each of the subqueries. So let's say if the system divides your initial prompt into three different prompts, you're going to get three different answers at this step. Then we take all of the combined context, all of the answers, all of the original questions, pass it to one last call of an LLM that will generate an answer that is going to be passed on to the user. So that is the final LLM. But after that, there is an independent verifier which looks at the original context that was returned by the retrieval step plus the original queries and look at the LLM final answer and then it grades it. So it really makes sure that the system is not hallucinating. There are multiple independent components that ensures the accuracy of the answer. And if the final verifier is confident enough, it will assign it a confidence level or confidence score and show the answer to the user. Now, at the moment, there's no looping back. So for example, if you're not able to generate answer, we cannot go back in the existing implementation and rerun other queries. It basically tells the user that how confident I am in this answer. And it makes a couple of suggestions in, in terms of modifying the query. So user is in the loop. The agent is not going to be stuck in a loop trying to figure out the final answer. If it's not confident enough after all of this, then it simply presents the user with a couple of options and the user can continue the conversation. Now, there are quite a few other ideas that I'm playing around with, but this is going to be the starting point for local GPT. Now, one thing which I really want to highlight is at the moment, there is no one fit all solution when it comes to RAG. Every RAG solution is application dependent. So for example, when you start with chunking or how you even process your data, that is highly dependent on what type of information you're feeding into the system. So I am looking for design partners. If you are a startup or a business who are trying to solve a very specific set of problems that can be expanded to a niche, please do let me know. I would love to work with you to kind of create a version of local GPT that is specific to uh, a domain area. And that's, I think, is going to be the way 
building niche specific solutions or versions of local GPT or a similar rag system in order to help businesses and enterprises extract information from their existing data sets. Okay, so this was a very quick overview of the architecture of local GPT. Now, the funny thing is that I worked as a technical manager. All of the code of local GPT is written by uh, a combination of different tools, including Gemini, OpenAI 3 Claude, Cursor, and Claude Code. I personally like to implement things in a small pieces and gradually build on top of it. It has been a very interesting learning experience trying to build a big solution, not just a demo. It actually works for a lot of different applications that I have been testing. I might share some of my learnings of building this with AI assisted coding. Now, if you're still here, you're probably thinking about how you can try it. Well, you'll have to wait for a couple of weeks. I still have to iron out a few issues, make sure the code doesn't break down. I have a few ideas that I'm going to implement. But at the moment, the original local GPT is still up on GitHub. Link is going to be in the video description. If you like this new direction, make sure to like and start the GitHub repo. That helps a lot with the reach. Now, I'm going to be keeping this existing version. That's probably going to be another branch. Initially, we're going to bring in all of the code to a new branch and then if it's stable enough we're going to replace it in the main branch and do let me know if you want to contribute to local gpt again it's an open source project people will be able to use and i also offer my consulting and advising serv services to startups and businesses so if you are looking for a highly scalable and accurate rag solution for your own business needs do let me know. You can reach out to me. Details are going to be in the video description. Anyways, do let me know what you think. And I hope you found this video useful. Thanks for watching. And as always, see you in the next one.